Minister to address the country for the third time since his self-isolation. I'm Rosemary Barton here in the nation's capital. Let's take a look live now at Rideau Cottage. That is the Prime Minister's official residence here in Ottawa. Uh, Justin Trudeau on the phone for uh, most of this morning as his cabinet COVID committee also met. He is expected today to really emphasize the importance of social distancing. What we've been talking about now for a number of weeks, but the, the, the uh, message really ramping up from the government and from public health in the past couple of days as an attempt to try and contain and mitigate the spread of this virus. He will also, we are expecting, address some of those new restrictions at the border, uh, which right now does not apply to Americans. Of course, earlier this morning, there was another announcement out of the biggest, uh, most populous province in this country, and that, of course, is Ontario. There are eight new cases of COVID-19 here in Ontario. That brings the provincial total to 185, the highest in this country. Five of those cases have been resolved so far. But earlier this morning, Ontario Premier Doug Ford announced a state of emergency, making it now the second province to do so. The Premier says it's an attempt to again help stop the spread. We're facing an unprecedented time in our history. This is a decision that was not made lightly. COVID-19 constitutes a danger of major proportions. We're taking this measure because we must offer our full support and every power possible to help our healthcare sector fight the spread of COVID-19. So this is just the latest province to do that. Just to confirm for you that at last count, we have 449 presumed or confirmed cases of COVID-19 in this country, and we still are at four deaths, all of them, in northern Vancouver, British Columbia, related to an elderly care centre. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick joins me now, though, from Ontario's legislature. And, and let's start here, Megan, before as we wait for the Prime Minister, because this was a significant announcement today in Ontario, though many people still wondering, what does it mean concretely? Can you spell that? out for us a little bit. Yeah, let's go through sort of what's now open and closed in this province, Rosemary. For starters, though, the, the Premier did announce part of these measures include no more gatherings of 50 people or more uh, in public spaces. And so any events planned, parades, for example, cancelled. He also said that includes uh, gatherings within places of worship. Now, it means a lot for businesses in this province. Restaurants and bars closed, effective immediately. They can only stay open if they're providing takeout or delivery service and libraries will be closed in this province recreation centers licensed daycares private schools have been ordered to close we know already public schools have been told to close for two weeks after this week's March break theaters are closed performing our centers movie theaters as well now what remains open essential services are still operating premier Ford said um, pharmacies open grocery stores open malls are still open um, though we do know a lot of retail chains have proactively decided to close their stores, but uh, offices can remain open as well as factories and public transit is still operating as well, Rosemary. As you heard him say in that clip, this is not a decision the government took lightly. He said he was talking to his cabinet late last night and early this morning. He said he did make this decision, though, based on the advice of his chief medical officer of health, Dr. David Williams. As part of the news conference, too, just to note, because there's likely a lot of worried workers in this province based on today's news, what it means for them, what it means for small business owners. Um, and he did talk about a relief package that will be offered by the government. $300 million is being dedicated to the COVID-19 response so far. Some of that money coming from the federal government, some of it coming from provincial coffers. Some of the money is already dedicated to frontline health care, though, in this province. He was talking about buying more protective equipment for health care workers, as well as hiring more people um, as well. And then for that support, though, for businesses and workers in this province, more to come on that in the coming days. He says that his ministers are in touch with their federal counterparts and uh, likely more measures announced in conjunction in the days ahead. But he did urge the federal government to hurry up and reform the EI system. 
Okay, great. Megan Fitzpatrick live at the Ontario Legislature. We'll come back to you, uh, Megan. Appreciate that. We are standing by right now, though, to hear from uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, for the third time since he had to self-isolate because his wife has tested positive for COVID-19. So he's in there doing his work with his wife and his three kids around him. He did, however, give a couple of interviews this morning and for uh, to look into those a little bit, talk about those as we wait for him to emerge in just a few minutes' time, I'm told. Vashi Capellas, the host of Power and Politics, is standing by here with me in Ottawa. So, Vashi, um, he did this morning talk a little bit more about those economic measures that uh, Megan alluded to, and that's important. Uh, it sounds like an announcement is likely tomorrow. Yeah, it does sound like he indicated, uh, I think yesterday he had said as early as today, but my understanding from speaking with a couple people uh, surrounding him is that they have a few more details to work out, so they do anticipate making that announcement tomorrow. A lot of big questions around something as simple as the tax deadline, for example. Will that be extended considering it's just around the corner, less than two weeks away? He said that is something that they're considering. There's also that ask that Megan was talking about, not just from the Premier of Ontario, but we've heard it from the Premier of BC, we've heard it from the Premier of Alberta. Lots of different provinces they are looking for help with EI either expanding the program changing the criteria different payments for different people will there be direct payments to mm -hmm. individuals in this instance as well he said essentially that everything is on the table and that's among the things that they are considering and trying to work out I think those EI questions though the tax questions they're the more immediate ones that need to be answered tomorrow and then businesses as well when you see the province of Ontario with that state of emergency clearly giving instructions and orders that actually carry penalties if they're not followed to businesses to shut down in certain instances to only operate you know for example with restaurants via delivery and takeout that has very serious economic consequences not just for the workers but the people who run mm -hmm. the businesses and yeah. so though they did make an announcement last week that involved more lending capacity for banks and more credit made available, I think to the tune of $10 billion uh, through the Export Development Bank, for example, and the Business Development Bank. Businesses will be looking for more and provinces have indicated that they will need more for those businesses. Yeah, I mean, he hinted at uh, allowing, expanding EI for people who don't qualify. So I imagine he's talking about the self-employed workers there. He talked about, as you say, more money for businesses and that would probably be small and medium sized businesses as opposed to large corporations. Mm -hmm. He hinted at mortgage help, which we've seen in, in other countries even this morning, France going so far as to say it will start paying bills for people if needed, um, and some kind of child benefits or a, an increase of where the child benefit is. But today is not really about that. Uh, today yeah. is is, a, is an entirely different message, but almost as critical, Vashi. Yeah, <coughs> definitely, Rosie. And today's message, I'm told, and I know our colleagues have been told as well, is very much about reinforcing what Dr. Tam said okay. yesterday, and that is the message around social distancing. I mean, we've been hearing it quite a bit, but it sort of has escalated over the past few days. Don't get together, for example, <coughs> with more than 50 people. No events for more than 50 people. Perhaps they'll go further than that. I don't know at this point, but uh, basically reinforcing that message. We also, and I, and I know you'll touch on this, but heard during another one of his interviews about uh, the border, and you did, you did sort of say that that might be part of the discussion today, uh, the restrictions at the border, Canadians who have <coughs> symptoms not being allowed to come into Canada. He said today in one of those interviews that there will be people who can't come home. And I imagine he's going to get a lot of questions about that. How many people do they anticipate? Under what circumstances? I mean, it's a very, you know, his tone yesterday and the message yesterday, as well as in those interviews, is a very serious one to people who are abroad right now. Mm -hmm. Certainly one that the government wants those people to be listening to. Getting home, though, right now, I think the reality of it is, and the Prime Minister indicated, is not going to be easy, and it may in some instances be impossible. So I'll be looking to see him expand on those statements as well. Yeah, okay, we've got a two-minute warning. Let me just uh, tell people why it also might be complicated to, to get home. WestJet says it is uh, suspending all commercial, international, and transborder flights for a 30-day period. That's starting Sunday, uh, so that makes it difficult. And some numbers that we just got to show that there's more than 400,000 Canadians registered with Global Affairs in different countries. That is not a complete list, and of course it doesn't mean that all those people will want to come home, uh, but that's the kind of numbers we're talking about. And just anecdotally, the number of people that have been reaching out on Twitter to say they're stuck is, you know, I have dozens and dozens. All right, here's the Prime Minister to address Canadians again. Let's bring that to you now, live, the Prime Minister of Canada. Before we get going, I want to recognize that earlier today, the province of Ontario announced a provincial state of emergency. At the federal level, we've been coordinating with them and continue to do so. Ontario is taking the right steps to protect people 
and the healthcare system. And today's announcement is an example of what we're seeing across the country. National coordination and local action that makes sense for the circumstances on the ground. And I want you to know, Canada is here for you, in Ontario and in all parts of the country. On that note, I want to recognize all of the people on the front lines of our health care system. Whether you're a doctor or a nurse, a hospital administrator or maintenance staff, you are doing an incredible job. I know that all Canadians are grateful. I also want to thank all of the retired health care workers who are putting up their hand and coming back to help take care of Canadians. But let's do more than just say thank you to our health care workers. Let's also do what we can to lighten their load. In her update on Monday, Dr. Tam was clear about what we should and shouldn't be doing. Do wash your hands often. Do sneeze into your elbow. And don't gather in groups of more than 50 people. These measures, and especially social distancing, are how we can ease the burden on our doctors and nurses so they can focus on our fellow Canadians who need it most. This is an especially important day on St. Patrick's Day. Lots of you probably had parties planned or were going to head out with friends. Now is the time to find another way to celebrate and to do that at home. I know people would probably prefer to just carry on as normal. I would too. But we all must take all action through social distancing to protect our health and the health of others. Nos médecins et nos infirmières our and ont besoin de votre aide. Need your help. Vos voisins your neighbors need your help. The most vulnerable in your communities need your help. As much as possible, stay home. Go out only if you absolutely must and try to work from home. Let the kids run around the house. Our doctors and nurses need your help. Your neighbors need your help. Vulnerable people in the community need your help. As much as possible, stay home. Don't go out unless you absolutely have to. Work remotely if you can. Let the kids run around a bit in the house. Things will get better. As the situation with COVID-19 continues to grow, our government will keep taking action too. For example, one of the things we're doing to flatten the curve is that as of Wednesday, Parks Canada is suspending visitor services at all national parks and historic sites. What this means for our parks is that pretty much anything with a door will be closed. La situation concernant la COVID-19 évolue et la réponse de notre gouvernement évolue aussi. Par exemple, Parks Canada suspend ses services aux visiteurs à tous les parcs nationaux et les sites patrimoniaux à compter de mercredi. C'est une autre façon de veiller à la santé de nos proches. Pour ce qui est des voyages, take care of those close to us. When it comes to travel, we have announced uh, new measures. Global Affairs has set up an emergency loan program of up to $5,000 to help people who need money quickly in order to come back home or to meet their needs while they're waiting to return. We took this decision after announcing that we would be closing our borders to people who are neither citizens or permanent residents of Canada. This uh, does involve a certain number of exceptions, including flight crews and U.S. citizens. Canadians abroad who need help on an urgent basis can always call 1-613-996-8885 to send an email to SOS uh, at uh, gc.ca. With respect to the economy, 
The entire government is working together to maintain the strength of our economy. We announced a series of measures involving $10 billion to protect jobs and support businesses. And very soon, we will be uh, making further announcements in that area. $5,000 as part of an emergency loan program through Global Affairs Canada. It will help people who need immediate financial assistance return home or cover their needs if they have to wait to get back. Canadians abroad in need of emergency assistance can always call 1-613-996-8885 or email sos at international.gc.ca. This comes as we announce that we are closing our air borders to people who aren't Canadian citizens or permanent residents, with some exceptions like for air crew and U.S. citizens. Earlier today, the Special Cabinet Committee on COVID-19 met once again to discuss our response. And full Cabinet will have a meeting this afternoon. We are hard at work to create the right support package for Canadians while protecting people's jobs and our economy. And tomorrow, we will be making another major announcement on economic actions to support Canadians as quickly as possible. By the end of the week, we will have more to say about changes for the upcoming tax season. We're looking at giving more flexibility for people to make payments and for businesses to have more liquidity during this time. Throughout this, we're working together right across the country. I have directed the House Leader to engage with his counterparts to discuss a brief return of the House of Commons so that we can bring in emergency economic measures. There are economic pieces that will need quick passage through the House in order to support Canadians. We are also examining the Emergency Measures Act to see if it is necessary or if there are other ways that will enable us to take the actions needed to protect people. Coordination at all levels and between all parties is vital. I have asked the Chair and Vice Chair of the Cabinet COVID Committee, Ministers Freeland and Duplou, to ensure that there are regularized briefings for premiers, leaders of the opposition, and other stakeholders for the foreseeable future. And yesterday, our regular calls with all parliamentarians began, which the Public Health Agency of Canada is moderating. Right now, we must all work together. The bottom line is this. Each one of us can make choices that help the people around us. In fact, we can make choices that will save lives. If we act now, even if it seems like a big ask, things will be better tomorrow. Thanks to our outstanding public health professionals, we have the information we need to make informed choices. So if you can, send an email or pick up the phone instead of meeting in person. Order takeout instead of going out to dinner and try to support your neighbours and friends if they're worried or need help. Canada, let's work together. I know we can do this. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Sir, you mentioned just now that you're thinking of recalling Parliament for emergency measures. Uh, before Parliament rose, they gave you a financial act that allows you to spend whatever you need to spend on this. What sort of measures might you need to take uh, that you don't already have? Actually, those are two separate things. We're talking about recalling Parliament briefly to pass legislative measures that will allow us to do things around EI, to do things around uh, a number of, of uh, methods to get money into the pockets of Canadians. We are also separately looking at the Emergency Measures Act to see if there are tools that they offer us that allow us to uh, do more things that uh, are needed for Canadians that can't be done other ways. We are looking at the possibility of recalling Parliament in order to pass legislative measures that would allow us to deliver aid directly to citizens. We have uh, the ability to invest right away to help Canadians, but there are legislative measures that will need to be agreed to by Parliament in order to move forward, and that is why uh, we are doing that.
La presse, now the number of cases in the United States is constantly increasing and there is a, a site and a significant site in Washington and elsewhere. When do you expect to close the border uh, with the United States? As I said, we are currently coordinating our efforts uh, with uh, the U.S. government and officials and doing everything we can to protect Canadians. Nothing has been ruled out. We're looking at all the options. We will do everything we can to keep Canadians safe. And at the same time, we are ensuring that we're not harming Canadians by uh, uh, preventing essential goods from getting through. Everywhere in the country, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, why not a federal directive on a, a something like closing bars and restaurants or other non-essential businesses? We have taken significant measures uh, up until this point every step of the way. We will continue to take necessary measures. Uh, we know uh, a number of provinces are moving forward in measures that are appropriate for them. And we will continue uh, to look at what we can do at the federal level to keep Canadians safe. Everything that needs to be done to keep Canadians safe is being done. Radio Canada. Now, how long will this last? People are now saying, we're ready to make an effort, but how long is this going to take? Are we talking about weeks, months? Can you be clear with them? You're asking them to make significant efforts. How long? Well, we're asking for significant efforts of our citizens, and we will be there to support our citizens, to support small businesses and large businesses, to support uh, people who require money, to to uh, feed their family or pay their rent. We don't know how long this will take. It could be weeks, it could be months. But we will be there uh, standing together to support Canadians in order to get through this extremely difficult time. Um, we will be there as a country for our citizens, for our businesses, for Canadians who are worried whether it's making sure that small businesses uh, can uh, remain viable through this difficult time, whether it's so that families can take care of their loved ones or put food on the table. We will make sure that Canadians are, be, are able uh, to uh, hold through this difficult time. We don't know exactly how long this is going to take, whether it takes weeks or months, but we know that every step of the way, we will be there to support each other. That's what Canadians do. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, Canada is responsible for the poor living conditions in Indigenous communities, which makes them more vulnerable to the spread of COVID-19. Why isn't more being done to prepare these communities for this pandemic? Uh, from the very beginning, uh, we have been working closely uh, with uh, Indigenous services, with uh, Indigenous leadership across the country to ensure that what is need needed to be done will be done for uh, Indigenous and remote communities. We know that there is a higher degree of vulnerability. There are already uh, vulnerabilities because of uh, difficult conditions in so many of those communities. That is why we are taking extra measures to ensure uh, that Indigenous people across this country remain safe. Prime Minister, up until yesterday, uh, it's uh, already almost two months since the uh, coronavirus uh, initially occurred in China and uh, Wuhan city and uh, Hubei province become the epic center. So uh, for two months, uh, even though more than 62 countries have taken measures to restrict travelers from China, Canada doesn't believe in closing the border, like did not take any measures to stop uh, travelers from that epic center. Then yesterday, it's uh, the announcement of just close the border, not only to people from the Epic Center, but also to every, almost everybody except the U.S. citizens. So it, it looks like a, you know, the policy is kind of from one extreme to another. Like what happened? What makes the, uh, the government to, to move the policy from one extreme to another extreme? I think people have noticed that the uh, situation has evolved incredibly rapidly around the world, and that does require different decision making at different moments. Uh, we took responsible decisions to, uh, to keep Canadians safe, uh, including uh, measures at the airports as uh, issues started to happen in Wuhan and in China. Uh, and that was able to keep Canadians safe as we saw a very low incidence of cases and spread of the virus in Canada, even though we didn't do what other countries did and closed the border because we followed the recommendations of 
uh, of our public health officials, and we were able to control the spread of the virus from the very beginning. Uh, the situation has now changed, and the recommendations of our uh, scientists and experts have changed, and we are continuing to do, and will continue to do, everything that is needed every step of the way to protect Canadians. Maura Forrest, Politico. Uh, yesterday, President Trump told Americans to avoid gatherings of more than 10 people. Today, you're still saying 50 people. Uh, why don't you believe that same advice is necessary to give Canadians now? And at what point would you be uh, at the point where you would give Canadians that same recommendation of limiting gatherings to 10 people? The advice uh, yesterday given by our Chief Medical Officer of Canada, uh, Dr. Theresa Tam, was to avoid gatherings of 50 people. But of course, Canadians should look to as much social distancing as possible. They should look to stay home. They should look to take measures that keep themselves and their families and their neighborhoods safe while not overburdening our public health system. These are the things that Canadians must do and we will continue to keep people informed on uh, the best ways to keep Canadians safe. Okay. Uh, La Dr. Theresa Tam, Dr. Theresa Tam notre, uh, uh, notre, uh, en chef au Canada, the uh, chief medical hier, officer, uh, announced yesterday that there should not be people uh, getting together in groups of more than 50, and that's exactly what I repeated today. But of course, all Canadians should try to isolate themselves as much as possible, stay home with their families, not go into the public, and take whatever measures are necessary to keep supporting each other. Minister, you told our colleagues at Radio Canada earlier that there are Canadians who just won't get home. Can you give us a sense of how many Canadians will be stranded? What kind of options are available to these Canadians, such as repatriation flights, for example? And how do you justify leaving them there? Uh, we are looking at every possible way of bringing Canadians home. Uh, there are three million Canadians at any given moment uh, around the world living and working, and I think it is just realistic to know that there are some of them who will not be coming home in the coming weeks. Uh, but we will make measures available through Global Affairs Canada, loans and supports. We're working with airlines to try and make sure that as many Canadians as possible, as many Canadians as want to, can come home. This is something that all Canadians uh, are expecting of their government, and we're going to be doing it. I think people know that there are almost 3 million Canadians who are traveling or living abroad at any point in time. And it is certainly the case that some of them will not be able to return to Canada in the coming days. But there are certainly a lot of Canadians around the world who will want to come back home, and that's why Global Affairs Canada is now making money available and assistance available to them, looking at flights. We're looking at everything we can do to facilitate their return uh, for as many Canadians as possible and as soon as possible. Why isn't the federal government uh, state, state, sorry, uh, invoking a state of emergency? And where is the government going to find all the money to pay for all the measures that you're going to have to roll out over the next little while? A state of emergency isn't necessarily something in itself. It is a way of enacting measures that otherwise would not be able to be enacted. So we are looking at the Emergency Act to look at what those measures are that it would make available and whether there are uh, other ways without having to bring in a state of emergency that we could uh, invoke them. We are examining that very carefully. And on the costs of the measures, uh, Canada has taken responsible fiscal decisions over the past years that have allowed us to have a significant room to maneuver on investing in our economy. We are uh, the G7 country with the lowest debt to GDP ratio, the lowest debt as a proportion, uh, deficit as a uh, debt as a proportion of the size of our economy, and that allows us to invest significantly in Canadians, in businesses, to make sure we're able to make it through this difficult time and make sure we continue to prosper and grow uh, once we are through this moment. That is the result of the decisions we have taken responsibly as a government over the past year. We'll now go to a few questions on the phone. Just one question, no follow-up. Thank you. We will take questions from the telephone lines. We will take questions from the telephone lines. 
If you have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Si vous avez une question, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant. The first question is from Mary Roche from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Hi, Prime Minister. Um, Canadians are getting very different messages from the provinces and from you and from cities. They're varying from stay with gatherings under 10 people to 50 people. And I'm wondering if you are worried that Canadians are getting mixed messages. From all governments is very, very similar. Stay at home as much as you possibly can. Engage in social distancing. Uh, look to care for your loved ones uh, and don't go out unless you absolutely have to. Uh, the uh, various recommendations will be suitable to various ju jurisdictions, but we are coordinating very closely across jurisdictions to ensure that Canadians get this message that it's time to stay home as much as possible. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question est de Hélène Buzetti, du Devoir. À vous la parole. Please go ahead. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur le Premier ministre. J'aimerais revenir à la question Prime de la Good afternoon, Prime Minister. I'd like to come back to the issue of the U.S. border. You said you have not made any decision because you don't want to disrupt supply chains. What is uh, the difference between cargo coming in and, and could you please clarify your position on this? It looks like you're waiting for Donald Trump to say it's okay. No, we are, in fact, trying to coordinate our actions with the U.S. authorities because we have a very high level of integration and when it comes to our supply chains and our economies. But we will always take the best measures for Canadians, and we will be looking very carefully at what we need to do in the next few steps. We took the necessary measures uh, every step of the line and we will continue to announce more as we go along uh, based on science and the recommendations of experts. All right, and that is uh, Justin Trudeau now speaking outside of his home at Rideau Cottage here in Ottawa, where he is self-isolating with his family because of his wife's uh, positive COVID-19 message. Uh, let's bring in host of Power and Politics, uh, Vashi Capellas, and the CBC's David Cochran, who I didn't get to before it started. My apologies, David. Uh, right. So the message there was, was really one of... Uh, let, let's be sure that we do the most we can right now to, to limit contact with people. Uh, the public health uh, agency is saying don't go anywhere with 50 or more people. I can tell you, you two are basically the only humans that I have seen in, in the past 24 hours. <laughs> and we're so in separate I, spots. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I am all good with the social distancing. Uh, Vashi, what stood out for you there and what the PM said? A couple of things and one, you know, some factual information that he provided, but, but actually I thought one sentence that he delivered will I think have a big impact on Canadians and that is the response he gave to the question when he was asked how long he thinks these measures will have to be in place, mm -hmm. how long mm -hmm. he thinks Canadians will have to act in this manner and he said he didn't know but that it could be weeks or months and I think we all know that. I think that you know on some level that's what we're hearing from professionals, health professionals, but I think to hear the Prime Minister say that uh, will have an impact on Canadians sure. and I think it, it speaks to the seriousness of what's going on right now. As far as what came out of what he said, a few things that we are expecting an announcement regarding the economy tomorrow, that towards the end of the week they will have something on taxes. We were speaking before about the, the upcoming deadline and whether or not that will be delayed. A lot of business owners thinking about that as well as individual Canadians. Uh, he also talked about the possibility of the House coming back and that the House leader Pablo Rodriguez was in conversations with his counterparts uh, to figure out how to do that. It looks like that would happen in order to pass legislation that would allow them to amend EI or I sort of and I'm interpreting what he said but allow them to uh, offer direct payments to Canadians. Mm -hmm. He didn't use those exact words but to get money directly to people who need it. We know that as we are speaking uh, I, I believe the um, Second, his uh, Bill Morneau's counterpart in the United States is announcing something very similar that they are about to do something like that direct payments to Americans as well so that's <coughs> something certainly to watch and then finally that they are considering the Emergencies Act and they are looking at it considering what may be available to them and in what way to use it I'm told to look at the one section of the act that involves public welfare and that certainly is around uh, shutting down things more broadly taking a more federal approach uh, to, to 
every all the instructions that we're getting at the moment. Okay, and of course that, that comes uh, the day that Ontario has uh, yes. declared a provincial state of emergency, although not used all the powers at, at the Premier's disposal right now, just shutting down certain places. He could go much uh, broadly, and, and the Federal Emergency Act, as, as you heard the Prime Minister say there, it, it's not clear whether it's necessary because it it's essentially allows the federal government to go in and do things provinces may not be doing. So they're, they're looking at whether those things are, are needed. David, he also talked about uh, Canadians that are stuck overseas after mm -hmm. saying earlier this morning that he on a radio interview that that it's there are Canadians who aren't going to get home like that's just not going to happen but there are some measures in place yeah there are some there's going to be financial support for people but as he said there are as many as three million Canadians who could be abroad internationally at any given point in time and given the rapid escalation of what has happened here a lot of people uh, may be stuck not because the government won't let them come home it's just there's no airline capacity or there's a, a flight surge and there's just no way depending on where they are in the world to move them because essentially huge chunks of the world uh, the borders are getting really thick and uh, the small world is getting quite large in distance as we go through this but you know unpacking thematically some of what we just heard from mm -hmm. the Prime Minister Rosie listen to your doctor in this case Dr. Tam is all of our doctors along with Bonnie Henry and David Williams and all the other public health officials but you know Canada is a country of rights but also one of responsibility responsibilities and he's essentially saying that now is a time for responsibilities for people to be responsible in their own personal behavior he's working from home everybody else should work from home as much as they possibly can but the, one of the traps in this or the problems in this Rosie is as people follow the medical advice of social distancing and staying home and not going out the economic damage mm -hmm. caused by COVID-19 simply expands and so we know now that the the stimulus or aid package will come tomorrow uh, we I think the legislative changes they need to make it to employment insurance is to allow people who don't qualify for EI who are self-employed or, or, or small business owners for example to qualify for EI as a way of making sure that you can put money into their pockets and put a financial floor under people in this enormously difficult time so they can keep the lights on and, and, and the fridge full. And, and the way they would do legislation, um, this was a thing that Pablo Rodriguez told us uh, when they suspended the House of Commons until at least April 20th. They've got a deal to bring everybody back, not 338 members of parliament, no, yeah. but a much smaller group, maybe random numbers of say 40, proportional to the standings. They can all spread out in the House of Commons and they can all work together to give the government the legislative authority they need. So we know Bill Morneau will roll out the more specific details of this tomorrow. And a sense of the order of magnitude, Rosie, economists have been telling the government any kind of a stimulus package needs to be the equivalent of roughly 1% of GDP. So that's in the 20 to $30 billion range. I'm told more or less that's where it's going to land in addition to the $10 billion in credit that was extended to small and medium-sized businesses on Friday. And uh, Vashi is exactly right. The, the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, is giving a press conference right now. We'll try and bring you some of that a little bit later, in which he is saying that he's going to drop the, the payroll uh, tax cut. He is going to find ways to directly get money to Americans. And, and he was asked whether the market should remain open as they continue to stumble along sort of blindly. And his answer was, was yes. Let me also just bring people up to date on news of another death in this country related to COVID-19. This is now the fifth death in Canada, though for the first time here in the province of Ontario. Um, it is a man who died at the Royal Victoria Hospital uh, in Barrie, a man in his 70s with underlying conditions who had contact with another person uh, who tested positive for COVID-19. Um, it, it's my understanding that the death, uh, that he only tested positive for COVID-19 after, but, but that would be the first death in Ontario. Remember, four other deaths in British Columbia, all related to one long-term care centre where there has been an outbreak. Uh, and this again reiterates that whole message that uh, there are particular pieces of the population that are more vulnerable, obviously, more susceptible to getting the virus, more susceptible to dying. But what you heard from the Prime Minister today, and, and we're standing by to take you to some cabinet ministers uh, speaking shortly as well, is it's not really about whether you are susceptible. It's about whether you will spread it uh, and also allowing capacity at hospitals, which is really the critical part of this right now as well. Uh, here are the cabinet ministers just getting ready to speak. I'll also just tell you that the prime minister did announce $5,000 loans for Canadians stuck abroad who need money to uh, get Hello, by everyone. or who need money to get out. And you can email um, sos at international.gc.ca for that. Here is the deputy prime minister, Christian Freeland. Uh, and then you'll have a chance to ask your questions. 
Merci à tous et à toutes d'être ici aujourd'hui. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, that there are now four Canadians, uh, four more Canadians who have died of COVID-19. And to their families and friends, all of us extend our sincerest condolences. Uh, today, we have just held a two-hour meeting of the Coronavirus Cabinet Committee. Uh, in particular, we discussed our border with the United States and the Emergency Act. As Canadians know, the Emergency Act is a measure of last resort, which, gr which grants the federal government extraordinary powers. It could never be invoked without consultation with the provinces. We are in a difficult situation. As the WHO said this morning dur during its daily update, this is the defining global health crisis of our time. Nous savons que la situation va s'empirer avant de s'améliorer. Nous nous will, uh, adaptons get worse et nous évoluons parce que we la situation est en train de parce que la situation est en train de évoluer chaque jour et chaque jour. Hier, le Premier ministre a annoncé de nouvelles mesures qui sont plus robustes to further stop the spread of the virus and to help Canadians and protect their safety. We know that these are extraordinary measures, but the extraordinary circumstances we see now demand them. To flatten the curve of the pandemic in Canada is closing. That's why I'd like to emphasize today how important it is that each one of us takes personal responsibility. Each of us needs to protect ourselves and each other. Hier, Dr. Tam Yester, a Dr. Tam encouraged all Canadians to avoid public gatherings of more than 50 people. It is extremely important that we abide by all of these recommendations. We can work online, Dr. and Tam we are encouraging you to stay home. To Canadians yesterday, she urged all of us to avoid gatherings of more than 50 people. It's very important for all of us to listen carefully to her. I can assure you our government does. Postpone, cancel, or move your event online, and please stay home. For employers and managers, Please find ways for your staff to work from home, if at all possible. Millions of Canadians are already stepping up and changing their behavior in order to keep themselves, their families, and their neighbors safe. The way we will flatten the curve is by practicing social distancing and listening to the excellent advice from Canada's health experts. If you can help a neighbor in need, please do so while maintaining social distance. We all need to work hard to protect the most vulnerable Canadians. Nous devons tous pratiquer we must all social practice uh, social distancing and stay home possible. as much as possible. A Team Canada means that we are taking care of each other. We rely on each and other. I'd just like to conclude by offering my deepest thanks to everyone who is on the front lines, healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, public health officials, researchers, border service officers, airport staff, and the many others who are working so hard around the clock for all of us. Thank you. Merci. Okay, now we will hear from our Minister of Health and Drs. Tam and Nu. Then we'll hear from our Minister of Heritage. Then we will hear from our Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Then from our Minister of Transport. And last but very much not least, uh, from our uh, le, le président du Conseil du Trésor et le vice président du Comité du Cabinet sur le COVID-19, Jean-Yves Duclos. So, Minister of Health, Minister okay. Heidi. Well, thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister. And, and first the of all, I uh, share the Deputy Prime Minister's condolences to the families uh, who have lost someone to COVID-19 and to all the families who are struggling with someone who's ill. Uh, right now and worried about what that means uh, for the health of, of their loved one and their and their family. Um, as we can see from the numbers, and Dr. Tam will talk about that in a moment, we've seen a substantial increase in the number of cases in Canada over the past several days. And when we say the window is closing, this is exactly what we mean. 
as we see numbers dramatically increase each day, what we're trying now together as a society to do is to flatten the curve of infection. And we also see uh, those numbers indicate that we see an increased level of community transmission. So the flatten the curve message today is really the most important one. The measures that we take today will help us uh, ensure that we can actually reduce the level of community transmissions that are happening across the country. So it's important that people are taking immediate action. You know the changes that we announced yesterday uh, but uh, around the border, and I won't repeat those, but I will say that obviously many Canadians who are traveling abroad are very concerned, and this is why we're setting up a program to support those Canadians and help them to return home. The changes that are happening right now are disruptive, and they are fast, and this is a stressful time for everyone. But we do have this opportunity right now to do what needs to be done to ensure the health and safety of all of our citizens and protect our health care system to be able to respond to the most critical of cases. And that's why I'm again asking Canadians for their help. It is up to all of us to limit the spread of COVID-19. Continue à vous laver les mains. Continue to wash your hands. Stay home if you're ill. Keep washing your hands. Stay home, especially when you're sick. And avoid large gatherings, even if you're healthy. Anything over 50 people now is too big. It is St. Patrick's Day today, but we have to practice social distancing even on days that we normally would be celebrating with one another. Don't shake hands. Keep a two-meter distance from each other. Acting together now will also protect all of our frontline workers, the health care providers, the border service agents, our police officers across our country, public health officials who are working so hard to protect us. And I want to thank all of those workers for their extraordinary efforts under such difficult circumstances. But I also want to thank all of the other workers who are keeping our grocery store stocked and the lights on. Thank you so much. We see you. We appreciate you. And we are so grateful as Canadians to continue to serve your fellow citizens. I'm very impressed to see Canadians coming together this way in a crisis, but I'm not surprised. We see what needs to be done together, and we are doing it with care and respect. This pandemic is no exception. We will get this through this hard time together. So my last appeal is make sure that you're kind to one another. Check in with vulnerable people by phone. Think of ways you can help to ensure that we get through this together. There are scared people. There are lonely people. There are frightened people. And it doesn't take a lot to reach out to them and say that you're there with them, even in spirit, to ask what they might need. We can do things for one another. We can deliver groceries to someone who has no ability to get out. We can ensure that there are ways that we can support our colleagues and our citizens. So just make sure you continue to ask how you can help. The same messages that we learned as children apply now. Share. Be kind. Ask how you can help. Together, as Canadians, we will get through this. Okay, well, thank you very much, Minister Haiti. Uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Tan, please. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Globally, there are now over 180,000 cases of COVID-19 in over 160 countries. As of right now, we have over 440 cases in Canada. Most of the cases continue to be among travelers or their close contacts. And we still have eight confirmed cases among Canadians repatriated from the Grand Princess cruise ship and quarantined in CFB Trenton. Most concerning is the increase that we're seeing in Ontario, including three cases reported yesterday that have no link to travel outside of Canada. These cases are currently being investigated as community transmission. The cluster of cases in a long-term care facility in British Columbia, and now the one death reported in Ontario, reminds us of the serious nature of this virus and its impact on high-risk groups. We also have a number of cases in several provinces that are connected to a large dental conference in Vancouver with about 15,000 participants. This again is a reminder of what these large gatherings can do to amplify COVID-19 and why it is so important to practice social distancing to de delay the spread. If Canada is to succeed at delaying the outbreak and flattening the epidemic curve, we will all need to bring our best game 
and Team Canada spirit to bear, to protect our country, and most importantly, to protect our vulnerable populations. Public health authorities are continuing with their strong efforts to detect cases, to meticulously trace and manage contacts. Our provincial and national public health laboratories have tested over 37,000 individuals to date. This allows us to identify cases quickly and interrupt any chains of transmission and slow the spread of COVID-19. For every one of us, we need to know that each of our actions to increase the physical space between us by curbing social gatherings, avoiding entertainment in crowded and closed spaces, postponing travel and living with everyday inconveniences, we can delay and dampen the impact of COVID-19 and protect our most vulnerable. But if the measure of a society is in how it cares for its most vulnerable, I'm calling on all of Canada to pull together and flatten this curve. I would like to remind Canadians that there is an ongoing need to continue donating blood. We need blood donors to book and keep their appointments to prevent shortages. Canadian Blood Services has robust cleaning, infection control and screening practices in place to protect all donors, staff and volunteers and as does Emma Quebec. Since this is St. Patrick's Day, I would like to quote a wise Irish colleague and a leader in the COVID-19 international response. Dr. Mike Ryan, director of the World Health Organization Emergency Program has said, be fast, have no regrets. The virus will always get you if you're not prepared. If you need to be right before you move, you will never win. Speed trumps perfection. The greatest error is not to move. So let's show them how we can move Canada. And this is our chance right here, right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tam. Dr. New. Merci et bonjour à tous. Thank you and good Le afternoon, Mondial, everyone. At the global scale, there are more than 180,000 cases of COVID-19 in 160 countries. Right now, there are more than 440 cases of COVID in Canada. Most of those cases continue to be identified among travelers. There are also eight confirmed cases of Canadians who were repatriated from a cruise ship, the Grand Princess, and who are now quarantined at CFB Trenton. The increase in the number of cases in Ontario is particularly concerning, with three uh, cases identified yesterday that have no link to travel outside Canada. Those cases are currently being investigated for community transmission. Other cases at a long-term care facility in BC where uh, some people have died reminds us of the seriousness of this situation and uh, its impact on people at high risk. There is now one death in Ontario as well. We can also see a number of cases in various provinces that are connected to a large conference of dental surgeons in Vancouver where 15,000 people were in attendance. That shows us once again the effect of large gatherings on the increase in cases of COVID-19 and the importance of social distancing in order to delay the spread. If Canada wants to succeed in delaying the spread of the virus and flattening the epidemic curve, we must give the best of ourselves and pull together in order to protect our country and particularly our vulnerable Canadians. Public health authorities are pursuing their sustained efforts to detect the cases of COVID and are doing robust contra contact tracing. The public health uh, laboratories in the provinces and in Winnipeg are conducting tests on more than 37,000 Canadians. We will be in a, a, ability, in a position to detect uh, those cases and determine the uh, transmission uh, trajectory. For the welfare of all, we need to ensure that through uh, each of our actions we are keeping a proper distance between ourselves and others by avoiding social gatherings and uh, uh, closed, uh, uh, well-attended entertainment complexes. 
we can delay the spread of this disease and mitigate the impacts and protect the most vulnerable Canadians. If a society is judged by its ability to take care of the most vulnerable, well, we're asking all Canadians to come together and flatten the curve. Before concluding, we just want to remind all Canadians that we still need blood donations. In order to prevent any shortages, we need blood donors to continue to keep their appointments and provide blood. The Canadian Blood Services has put in proper hygiene practices to fight infection and can protect any donors as well as employees and volunteers. To celebrate St. Patrick's Day, I'd like to quote uh, from a well-known Irishman, Dr. Mike Ryan, from the World Health Organization, where he is the chief physician. What he said is, be fast and have no regrets. The virus uh, will catch us if we're not ready. Speed will always trump perfection. That's the most important thing. The biggest mistake is to not take action. Let's show them what Canada can do. Let's take this opportunity now. Thank you. Okay, maintenant on va écouter le ministre du Patrimoine canadien. The Minister of Canadian Heritage, Stephen Guilbeault. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I offer my sincerest condolences to the friends and family of the four Canadian victims to date and to say that uh, I am with all of those who are touched, who are affected by the spread of this virus. We are fully aware of the decisions of the public health authorities, authorities on independent workers, community organizations, and the arts, culture, and sports sector. We have said that we would continue to take proactive decisions as the situation evolves, and that's what we're doing. That also means prevention on a large scale. That is why as of tomorrow, that is March 18th, and until April 30th, all uh, Parks Canada facilities will be closed, and Parks Canada will no longer admit any visitors. It will suspend all its visitors linked to its national parks, historic sites, and marine conservation areas. Only essential services regarding a search and rescue, as well as maintenance, will be maintained. And up to April 30th, the physical installation of Parks Canada will no longer be open. Parks Canada will no longer admit visitors and will suspend all services related to its national park, historic sites, and national marine conservation areas. Only essential research, rescue, security service, services, and maintenance will be maintained. The Prime Minister said yesterday, and I now repeat, our number one priority is to protect the health and safety of all Canadians. We are using scientific data to do so. No decision is taken lightly. And that is why, if you are in doubt, follow the directives of your local health agency as well as the Canada Public Health Agency. They are best suited to guide you as individuals or organizations or businesses. I might remind you that the closing of Parks Canada is under the responsibility of Environment Canada and is part of joint efforts with provinces and municipalities to protect the health and safety of our communities by focusing on social distancing measures. Please stay home. That is the best way to protect yourselves and to protect your family and the most vulnerable populations. These are joint and individual efforts, and these are what is needed to slow the spread of coronavirus. We have to uh, temporarily uh, suspend activities to preserve our values and the uh, referring to mutual aid and solidarity. I would also like to thank all Canadians for your rigor and your patience, and also thanks to those who are being creative by uh, putting their tools free of charge or at a very low price at the service of uh, Canada. You are reaching out to Canadians and that is very important. All culture, our culture continues to uh, live online and uh, thank you for everyone who provides information to enlighten us with regard to current events. Other announcements will follow in coming days. This opportunity to thank Canadians for your determination and patience. Thank you as well 
for those who continue to freely offer their creative material to the public and for continuing your very important educational work. Our culture lives on, online, through your platforms. Thank you for ensuring that people have access to quality information, which apprises us on the current events. More announcement will follow in the coming days. Merci. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. And Minister Gilbo. Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Bill Blair, please. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, as a result of the measures that we announced yesterday and on the advice of public health, um, our Canada Border Services have increased their operational posture, and I'd like to just quickly review the measures that are now in place. All international travelers are now being asked, do you currently have a cough, difficulty breathing, or, have, or do you feel you have a fever? They are also asked to confirm the following statement. I acknowledge that I've been asked to self-isolate for the next 14 days to prevent the, provincial, the potential spread of COVID-19. There is now an enhanced uh, officer, border officer presence at all major ports of entry to carry out public health screening and outreach, and officers are on the lookout for any traveller who, who looks sick or um, who, who reports that they are feeling symptoms, and they will re refer all suspected cases to public health authorities. These measures have not only come into effect at, for air travellers, but have also been implemented for land, rail and ferry travellers. Instructional handouts are being provided to all travellers arriving in Canada. The handout advises them to self-isolate at home for 14 days, to monitor themselves for symptoms and to contact public health authorities should they develop symptoms. In addition, m masks are being distributed to high-risk travellers as required, and there's also an increased signage at all of our points of entry, as well as enhanced cleaning and disinfection of high-traffic areas and facilities at our airports. I also would like to have, take the opportunity to clarify for Canadians, we know that there are very many Canadians, for example, who are pr presently in the United States and are quickly making their way home. And I want to assure them all, Canadians will always be allowed to return to Canada. And if a Canadian who returns is exhibiting symptoms and when they present themselves at a land border or, or port of entry, they will immediately be referred to a Public Health Agency of Canada quarantine officer for examination. We, but they will, of course, be allowed into the country. And following that assessment, the traveler will either be given a mask and instructed to self-isolate at home or, in the more severe cases, subject to further examination by a quarantine officer. Higher volume land border crossings will have a public health representative on site, while smaller ports of entry will go through examination of symptoms over the phone with public health. We are constantly evaluating the situation and we will take whatever measures may be proved necessary. We'll continue to work closely with health authorities, border officials, our provincial and territorial partners, and we are in very close contact, working with our international partners to ensure that we do what is best for Canadians. I'd also like to speak because we've had a number of inquiries about individuals who cross our borders irregularly seeking uh, refugee status. The measures that are currently in place is that those individuals are immediately taken into custody by the RCMP. They are screened thoroughly by our customs border officers. Um, this process takes about 24 hours and they are now also being screened for any evidence of symptom and questioned about, about, about their, where they have been. Under normal circumstances, when this process is, is concluded, and as they go into our processes of determining their eligibility for refugee status, they are moved to temporary shelter, usually in, in Montreal. But because of the need for the 14-day self-isolation, we are now making separate arrangements for those individuals to be, to be placed in appropriate shelter in order to accommodate the requirement for the period of isolation. We are doing this because we believe it is necessary and in the best interest of, me, of keeping all Canadians healthy and safe. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister Blair. Maintenant, le ministre and now we go to the Minister Martin. of Transport, Marc Gallo. Merci et bonjour et Thank you. Aussi, good afternoon. Et and I would also like to add my condolences to those who have uh, lost uh, a family or friends due to COVID. Yesterday, our government announced unprecedented measures in order to protect uh, Canadians' health and safety with regard to COVID-19. As of midnight tonight, all uh, incoming 
shipping flights from Europe, Asia, and South America will be redirected to Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, or Vancouver. As of tomorrow morning, as of uh, tomorrow noon, rather, Canada will refuse the embarkment of uh, foreign nationals on flights to Canada from all countries except the United States. Canada will also refuse uh, uh, access to foreign nationals from the United States if they have resided outside of Canada or the United States in the past 14 days. Any passenger exhibiting COVID-19 symptoms, regardless of nationality, will not be allowed to board a flight to Canada. Also, every traveler will need to remain in self-isolation for 14 days if they come to Canada, whether it is by plane or through the land border, and regardless of their nationality. These measures are robust and unprecedented. We are assessing the situation on an hourly basis and taking action as appropriate to protect Canadians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Garneau. And, maintenant, le président and now we go to the President of the Treasury Board, Mr. Jean-Yves Duclos. Thank you, Ms. Freeland. And uh, as my colleagues have said, the situation is changing rapidly. And in this context, uh, we have we held a uh, meeting of the uh, Cabinet uh, Committee on COVID-19. And uh, we will have a full Cabinet meeting because all of uh, the ministers play an important part of managing this crisis, which is unprecedented in the history of our country. This morning, Prime Minister Trudeau announced a number of measures that I will summarize very quickly. The House of Commons will be summoned by Mr. Pablo Rodriguez, the leader of the House, uh, to give legislative approval very quickly to a measure, or to rather measures, of economic uh, stimulus and support, especially to Canadians who are going through uh, difficult uh, conditions right now. And uh, so Parliament will be uh, reconvened rapidly. We are also considering the use of the Emergency Measures Act. All members of the cabinet are being consulted in order to uh, hear from, uh, to get the opinions of the uh, provinces and territories. And also this morning, we have received important notices from the public health agency. Uh, gatherings of 50 people or more are discouraged. The public health agency also reminds Canadians to not travel abroad unless it is for essential reasons, that all visitors, such as Minister, as Minister Blair said, regardless of where they come from and regardless of uh, uh, where they go through, must self-isolate for a minimum of 14 days, and we would encourage, th and they should not leave their homes uh, unless necessary. I, was, I might also remind that uh, Prime Minister uh, announced uh, uh, emergency loans of up to $5,000 for people who are going through difficult times, uh, for pe people who wish to come back to Canada but who are having trouble doing so, and so Prime Minister Trudeau allowed, uh, announced uh, the availability of these emergency loans. And uh, finally, in cooperation with uh, other uh, cabinet ministers, Ms. Friedland and myself will be forming, uh, creating a formal mechanism to work with the provinces and territories in this emergency context. We are also going to be work, uh, we're also going to work to put in place a mechanism to ensure that all members of parliament, as well as the opposition members, can quickly have access to the correct information so that they can do the work that is required with their constituents. And uh, there is going to be a council that will regularly meet, uh, that will represent social organizations and workers and uh, to deal with this crisis. But the Prime Minister's main message the, this morning was uh, that people should take care of themselves and of others because there are a great many people, such as, as Minister Haidu said, there are many people who feel alone, who feel vulnerable, who feel anxious. And in this difficult context that we're going through, we have to remember to take care of others and take care of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Duclos. And we are now ready to take questions. Thank you. We're going to question period now. Minister Blair, that you have to leave. So uh, Minister Blair will remain available for questions after Cabinet. Uh, so we'll go with three questions in your room, and then we'll go over the phone. Three questions in the room, and then three questions over the phone. And then we'll alternate that way. And so we're going to begin with Hélène Buzetti, Le Devoir. Inaudible for the interpreter.
You are organizing things with the airline company concretely. What do you intend to put in place? Yes, definitely, and that is something that uh, uh, Minister Champagne is doing as well. We're, we're speaking with our Canadian airlines in order to be able to repatriate Canadians who are stuck abroad, and uh, we're currently in discussions with them so as to be able to choose uh, certain places in the country where it will would be possible to send flights so that we can repatriate those people, uh, sort of a bridge to these destinations. We're in the preliminary phase right now of these discussions, but uh, I am certainly hopeful that uh, that's the direction we're heading in. Question for Mr. Duclos. You talked about emergency measures, and I would like to know what this act will allow you to do to reconvene Parliament because in the motion on Friday, this is allowing the government... The interpreter cannot hear the question. Uh, so regarding recalling the House, uh, Minister Mono will soon have uh, uh, more specific information regarding the measures to put in place, and uh, some of those measures will require uh, the Parliament to be reconvened. Now, also, uh, we need to work with all the provinces, including Quebec, to ensure that the federal government and has all the tools it needs to support them. And in this kind of emergency uh, context and crisis, we must ensure that the federal government has all the tools required to help, because... The travail important des provinces and territories. So there are évidemment très sérieux. very serious. That means that respectifs parce qu'on touche à beaucoup de, de ministères différents vont rapidement euh, entrer en contact avec leurs collègues provinciaux. Madame Freeland va coordonner euh, l'exercice pour nous assurer que nous avons toutes les tous les outils qu'il nous faut pour appuyer les provinces et les territoires. So that we have all the tools that we need for the Canadian government to do our job over the next little while, and uh, one of the considerations. Uh, that and that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau referred to is the use of the Emergency Measures Act. Thank you. Well, I think there is testing for those with travel history, but also those who have symptoms who are, for example, hospitalized and with pneumonia, for instance. So that's really key, because if you test people who don't have a travel history, that's how you're going to detect uh, community spread. So this is happening. We're hearing from jurisdictions now, whether it's in uh, British Columbia or in Ontario, that they're looking at certain cases that look like they have been acquired in the community. So this is a signal for us that we must do everything that we can now to stop the chains of transmission. So you can't eliminate the possibility of uh, community spread in certain areas. And that is why you're seeing these um, much increased in public health action to um, essentially ask everyone to do social distancing. This is the really key way that you're going to interrupt those chains of transmission. Uh, we are collaborating in province, province and territories on like a daily basis. And right now, they um, we are um, working together to affect any kind of um, need to purchase and to get those uh, kits. So as far as I know, uh, while we are planning, certainly, to have to focus those test kits on the people who are most likely to have the, the, the virus, um, we are not seeing any major issues from the perspective of being able to detect cases and to be able to detect if we do have community transmission in Canada. But I would say that you need to, as everybody has said, look where the puck is going and not necessarily where we're at now and just inter you know, do everything you can to interrupt uh, potential chains of transmission, even 
even if you're not seeing it. So that's the approach that we are taking right now. But this is very diffusely uh, spread between provinces and territories. It is up to them and within their own laboratories to be able to test. We do know, as I said, we've tested 37,000 people already. We know that the daily capacity of provinces in general is much bigger than that. So we have not exceeded that capacity, and we're continuing to work together to look at supplies. And I'll just add, uh, we've got a number of processes happening under Health Canada right now to accelerate approval of alternative testing processes. So we'll have more to say about that once mm -hmm. we have some details. Question inaudible for the interpreter. Inaudible for the interpreter. What Minister Blair said is that uh, once these people have been taken into custody by the RCMP and the uh, CBSA, they will be required to be in quarantine or self-isolation for a period of 14 days. Right now, they, it is not planned that they will be in this situation in Montreal, but rather in places that... I will have to come back to you on this. I'll have to specify where these places are, but uh, we will need to supervise them in these places. They'll need to be supervised for 14 years, 14 days rather, and provide, be provided with certain services. Well, I think I'll Thank you. That's a great question. I think I'll repeat what Dr. Tam and uh, François-Philippe Champagne uh, most recently has said, which is now is the time to come home. I believe the Prime Minister has also said that, and it is irrespective of your circumstance, whether you are a snowbird and you have a semi-permanent resident there at residence in Florida, for example, or Arizona or not, uh, it is time to come home. Um, as we can see, and then we, as we've seen since earlier days, this is a very fluid situation and things change rapidly. Uh, also, uh, on top of that, I mean, uh, if people do become ill, uh, it is much better to become ill in your own home country where uh, you know that you have appropriate health coverage in a way that uh, you can be certain as a Canadian. Uh, and finally, I will just say that uh, as situations change, uh, worldwide with border and travels and quarantines and various local, uh, state level and federal level uh uh, measures. Uh, we can't predict uh, where other countries will go as they try to skate to where the puck is going. And it is uh, of utmost importance that snowbirds and their fam families of snowbirds encourage uh, those folks to come home now. And, and I do want to be clear, Canadians will always be able to come home, Canadians and permanent residents. Mm -hmm. People need to be clear about that. That's a right we all have. We'll now go over the phone, operator, operatrice, à vous maintenant. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at the time if you have a question. Step up, please, sur le If you have any questions. Our first question is from Marika Walsh with the Golden Mail. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi there. Thank you. I'm wondering if you can speak specifically to the Emergencies Act. What specific powers are you strongly reviewing and why? Uh, thank you. This is uh, Jean-Yves Duclos. Well, I'll provide you with two pieces of advice. The first one is, as, I've, as the Prime Minister said uh, just uh, this morning, we uh, are considering the, uh, the use of the uh, Emergency Measure Act, and the objective being that we want to be uh, prepared to assist the uh, important work of provinces and territories. And therefore, in that context, our cabinet ministers are going rapidly to engage with their counterparts to see whether this is a, a, an avenue that will make us even more effective in working with them and supporting their important work in the context of this crisis. The second thing is that the, the Act says basically that uh, we can use that law to either 
regulate the movement of people, the movement of goods, and restrictions to that movement. And uh, that implies, therefore, uh, restrictions, possible restrictions on travel, um, evacuations of people, the provision of essential goods and services in the context of the emergency situation in which we are currently funding ourselves. Yes. And can you so that's exactly clarify right. America, if I could just add one thing, it's Christia. Yeah. Um, we are very aware that the Emergencies Act is a measure of last resort, which does grant extraordinary powers to the federal government. Uh, we began a discussion of it today. Uh, and we are also very aware, as Minister Duclos has just explained, that it could never be invoked without consultation with the provinces. And can you please clarify, we're hearing mixed messages, or at least from my understanding, of who can come home. You're saying everybody can come home, but at the same time, you're saying people who are ill or have symptoms can't get on planes. So, so can you clarify that for everybody? Yes. What, uh... What the DPM said was that, of course, all, and uh, Minister Blair, all Canadians can come home. And by Canadians, we also include permanent residents, and we also include immediate family, uh, immediate family members. Um, what uh, the clarification is, is that if a person is symptomatic, uh, they will not be allowed to come home until their symptoms are treated um, wherever they happen to be. And that is why we have also announced that there will be some financial help as they get through that, uh, that difficult period and, uh, and eventually are able to come home. Merci. La prochaine question, opératrice. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Merci. Our next question is from Laura Osmond with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi there. Sorry about the delay. Um, we have a number of questions about flattening the curve. Right now, you're trying to make sure that people socially distance and, and flatten that curve so that it doesn't go above sort of the line for what our health care system can handle. What is happening now to sort of make that line go higher to increase the capacity of our health care system? Uh, thank you. It's uh, Patty Haidu. Uh, I, I will answer that and I'll turn it to Dr. Tam. That work has been happening uh, to prepare our health care system since the very early days when we noticed increased activity uh, in Wuhan. And Dr. Tam immediately called a, a meeting or convening, uh, if you will, of a special committee that includes uh, public health officers uh, from all across the provinces and territories to begin that planning. Of course, uh, in the early days, it was very unclear how serious this would become for Canada, but that work began nonetheless because we knew that should we see uh, any kind of outbreak in Canada and, uh, God forbid, where we find ourselves now in a full pandemic, that our health care system would need to be fortified and that provinces and territories would be need to taking appropriate steps to do that work. Uh, I will also indicate that the committee that Dr. Tam convened is not just comprised of just the chief public health officers, but there are several other committees that work on very technical aspects of that preparation, uh, including what kinds of equipment and including human resourcing concerns, including a number of other measures. And so we have been working with provinces and territories to boost our capacities and to understand what kinds of demands would be placed on the healthcare system if we were to see the same type of curve that we were seeing first, of course, in China and then later in Italy and Iran. I'll turn it to Dr. Tam to talk about some of those specifics. Yeah, it's actually quite incredible, I think, across the country to hear from every province and territory how they're planning to ready the health system. So some of the um, measures that they're taking includes already invoking uh, response plans in uh, health facilities. They are reducing elective surgeries and, and elective procedures and reducing any um, potential um, impact on those very valuable hospital assets and hospital beds. 
Um, they are uh, using telemedicine in a way that I feel to be maybe a legacy of the outbreak itself is the fact that people are using innovations to try and get care to people in different ways. Uh, that includes also having billing codes even for physicians who are doing um, these consultations remotely. So what you're trying to do is increase the maximum amount of capacity for the health system to treat those who have more serious uh, presentations of the COVID uh, virus. We actually see jurisdictions putting out online self-assessment tools so that people who've come back from travel, for instance, who may, maybe they don't need to be looked at in the clinic so that you don't inundate that, those systems as well, um, it's also at play. As well, of course, we're readying all those systems that we've talked about, the laboratory systems, the surveillance systems, um, protecting our health workers, very important, collaborating on getting equipment, which includes the purchasing, for example, of ventilators. So all of those things together help improve and increase that line that you saw where you want to get that curve under. And we're trying to, of course, boost that line on the upward uh, trajectory. Thank you. And for uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, we got a preview of some of the economic um, measures that were going to be announced tomorrow, but what kinds of things are your committee considering? Considering a lot of economic supports tend to be things that get people spending money, and that's not necessarily appropriate right now as people are staying home more and, and not going out into the community as much. Um, so first of all, you know, the Prime Minister has foreshadowed that uh, we will be unveiling, Minister Morneau will be unveiling uh, some further strong economic measures. Uh, I would never uh, steal his thunder, uh, but let me assure everyone that we understand the seriousness of this situation and the federal government absolutely understands that we need to do and we will do whatever it takes to ensure that our economy can weather the storm. Uh, this is economically a unique situation because on one hand, the very important measures we are taking to prevent the health and safety of Canadians simultaneously are leading to a reduction of economic activity. We are, as a country, asking people to stay home, and we are seeing, uh, and I would really like to praise this, forward-looking action by cities and provinces shutting down places where people gather. That is absolutely the right thing to do, uh, and it does inevitably have an economic impact. Uh, the way that we are thinking about this, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but the way that we are thinking about it uh, is very much, uh, I would say, along the lines of things we're seeing from other countries that have been uh, faced this earlier than we have. Uh, countries like Singapore, which have focused on what can you do to be sure that this period when we need to socially distance. We need to stay home. Economic activity inevitably, therefore, subsides. How can we take measures to ensure that no damage is done to sectors of the economy, that no damage is done to Canadian businesses, and that individual Canadians are able to continue to get through that, are able to continue to buy their groceries, to pay their rent, during this period. And at the same time, there's a real focus on ensuring that all the essential services that we need, even in this time of social distancing, are able to go on. So you know, Minister Haidu today and yesterday has made the very important point that, of course, we're thanking our healthcare professionals, but we also need to thank all of the people who are ensuring that we still have groceries in our stores that we still have medicines in our drugstores, that we still have heat and light in our buildings. And so that also needs to be and is a part of our economic approach. And I see Minister Duclos, who is also very involved in our economic thinking, kind of looks like he's fidgeting beside me. Do you want to add anything, Shanif? 
Mais très brièvement, pour euh, appuyer entièrement ce que, ce que vous dites, euh, ministre uh, Freeland, c'est exactement l'objectif. Effectivement, nous sommes dans une crise that, yes, économique unique. Nous sommes dans une crise unique uh, type de crise économique unique. C'est unprécédenté dans l'histoire du Canada parce que nous avons des issues de uh, both supply et de demande. Les Canadiens uh, ont une très limitée demande à cause de l'insécurité économique qui prévale. They uh, have to pay for food, their rent, they need to buy medication, uh, goods and services that to Canadians need to survive. That's what they need for the next few weeks. But in addition, there's a problem of supply because uh, the production of goods and services is uh, uh, slowed down. It's very complicated because of the very rigorous policies that we're putting in place to protect the health and safety of uh, Canadian workers and families. So it's a, a very new economic uh, situation, and the measures that are going to be announced by Minister Molno are measures that are going to take into account these issues of both supply and demand with regard to production and consumption. Thank you. Merci. Dernière question. Uh, Thank you. Téléphone. Last question on the telephone. Thank you. Merci. Next question is from Lauren Gartner of Politico. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I'm wondering what sort of financial aid uh, might the cabinet be considering for uh, transportation carriers in Canada? I'm thinking specifically of Air Canada, Transat, WestJet and uh, also via rail as they see demand plummet. Mr. Garneau, maybe you'd like to take that? Thank you. Uh, we are certainly uh, in close contact with all of our airlines, uh, particularly those that fly internationally, but also domestically, as well as via rail, one of our crown corporations. And we are being made aware of the um, unprecedented unprecedented uh, effect that the coronavirus is having on their businesses. Uh, the number of reservations on flights, both internationally, transporter, and even domestically, has dropped, I would say, in a almost precipitous manner because of what we are dealing with at the moment. So we are in discussions with them at the moment. Uh, I can't give you more specifics, but we realize that this important sector of the economy is uh, is bearing a very heavy burden at this point in time. And uh, a quick follow-up on the Emergency Act discussion. I'm wondering, could you tell us at what point do we need a measure of last resort? How, how, how will the federal government know when Canada is at that point? Let me just start by saying, you know, we want to be very clear. We do understand that the Emergencies Act is a measure of last resort. It is a very serious step, which grants extraordinary powers to the federal government. We would never introduce it without careful consultation with the provinces. And what we are now doing, as Minister Duclos and the Prime Minister described, is very carefully looking at that. And I think Minister Haidu has some thoughts to share also. Thanks. That's a great question. And I think, um, you know, using the Emergencies Measures Act, as uh, Minister Freeland has said and uh, Minister Duclos has said, would be a really, truly last resort. Um, I have been very encouraged by the conversations that I've been having with my counterparts across the provinces and territories. It is clear that provinces and territories are taking the responsibility seriously about their efforts to contain this virus within their own jurisdiction and have had good collaboration at the local level with municipal politicians and municipal leaders. So I think um, as we examine our own pieces of legislation that we are each responsible for as ministers of the Crown, we will be able to better determine if there are gaps and there may be other uh, approaches that we can take that uh, uh, lets us avoid using the Emergencies Measures Act. Quite frankly, from my perspective, uh, you know, let's hope we don't have to get to that point. And there is no indication right now that provinces and territories are not willing to collaborate. Everybody understands this is a true national crisis and that we need to work together as leaders of our country, as leaders of our provinces and leaders of our local governments to do, to do what we need to do to flatten the curve. Thank you. We'll go back to questions from the floor. Uh, Hatsu Canada. 
inaudible for the interpreter. Inaudible for the interpreter. Very quickly, two answers. The first is uh, last Wednesday, the Minister Morneau, you might remember, announced uh, measures of $1 billion. As some of that money was aimed at helping provinces to put in place uh, resources, tools, and the mechanisms required to take care of people's health. The other uh, was to accelerate the production of vaccines and medication, but there were also substantial measures that completely eliminated the waiting period for to receive EI uh, sick leave benefits. And uh, that has the potential of helping between 65 and 70 per 75 percent of workers on the labor market in Canada right now. So those are measures that were set up very quickly because we always already had the tools to do so. Now what Mr. Molno is doing in this context where the crisis will last for some time is that very quickly we will know more in the next hours and days. Inaudible for the interpreter. The question is inaudible. Answer. In Canada, we are lucky enough to have a public health system that is uh, universal, accessible, and uh, free of charge, and that protects us much better than, it, uh, than in other countries. Uh, we're also lucky because we have a very robust economy to date, one of the best economies in the world, with uh, one, of, one of the lowest unemployment rates since uh, 1976. We have to remember that. But three weeks ago, we were... Uh, in uh, one of the in one of the most enviable positions in the in among the G7 countries, we're also lucky because we have uh, a, a budgetary capacity that is among the strongest among G7 countries. We have among the uh, the highest credit rating in the uh, G7 uh, countries. Uh, so we have the capacity to intervene very quickly and robustly, and we're going to do so because we want to protect both the health and safety of Canadians. But we also want to protect people's ability to uh, do what they can to protect themselves and their families. Thank you. Well, you want to go back? I'll, I'll start. I think, first of all, uh, obviously, I, I am not privy to what extra measures he's specifically talking about, and obviously there will be an announcement. But I think uh, when we think about the remote and isolated communities and the fragility of those communities from the perspective of infrastructure, from the perspective of health care, from the perspective of underlying health conditions, obviously there are communities that present, and in this case, Indigenous communities, that present a higher risk for contracting COVID-19 and a higher risk for serious outcomes. So I think the Prime Minister is right to say that Indigenous communities require extra attention and extra support to make sure that their members are protected and that they have uh, the same level of health care should we see an, uh, a, an outbreak in an Indigenous community. Yeah. And just add some of the measures we've taken already, of course, have been valuable and important for all Canadians, uh, but were taken with the knowledge that they have particular relevance for Indigenous communities. So Minister Garneau's cruise ship ban announcement, particularly valuable for our northern communities, which could have been had we not taken that action particularly exposed. The measures the Prime Minister announced yesterday with regard to non-Canadians traveling to Canada, that is a particular area of exposure for remote and northern communities, which are conscious of uh, their health care resources and of, the, and of their uh, often very confined living conditions. So they're very concerned, and quite rightly, that if the coronavirus were to get into one of these communities, managing it would be very, very difficult. So in the measures we've taken already, 
we have absolutely been thoughtful about and listening to what we are hearing from the Indigenous and Northern communities. Mark Miller is a member of the Coronavirus Cabinet Committee. And as Minister Haidu said, and as the Prime Minister said, there will be additional specific measures announced very soon. Well, Minister Miller was with us in our coronavirus cabinet committee meeting just before this. Uh, he will, you know, the idea behind these daily briefings is ministers who have particular announcements to make will be here. That's why we have Minister Gilbo with us today to talk about parks. So you will be seeing Minister Miller when he has the specific measures to announce. And he did today uh, share with the members of the committee what is happening in specific communities. I do also want to say, you know, as we've heard from Dr. Tam, Dr. New Minister Haidu, we are seeing across the country, whether it is cities or provinces or specific Indigenous communities, Canadians acting and taking the right measures and the right actions for those communities. That is the right thing to do, and we applaud and support it. Premier Ford phoned me this morning before announcing Ontario's emergency decision. And that's what we need to do. We all need to be acting and taking the right measures in our own communities, and that very much includes Indigenous communities. At the same time, the federal government is here to lead and to provide the necessary resources, and we're going to do that too. Global News for next question. Our action when it comes to the U.S. border is very much about understanding that the Canada-U.S. border is a particular relationship and a particular border for Canada. Nearly 200,000 people cross that border every day, and that border and that traffic that goes across that border is literally a lifeline for both the Canadians and the Americans on both sides of that border. We get our groceries thanks to truckers who drive back and forth across that border. Very urgently needed medical supplies and medicines go back and forth across that border. And essential workers go back and forth across that border every day. So it is a unique relationship for Canada, and it's important for us in handling our situation on the border to be sure that we act to get things right. And that is what we are doing right now. We did discuss at uh, in great detail at the Coronavirus Cabinet Committee meeting this morning. We discussed the situation on the Canada-US border. We are, all ministers are urgently talking with their departments with their stakeholders. We are talking with business. We are talking with labor. We are talking with the provinces. We're very aware that the situation for British Columbia is particularly acute. And I had a long conversation with Premier Horgan about it last night. We are very clear that just as Dr. Tam has encouraged Canadians strongly not to make non-essential trips outside Canada, let me encourage potential visitors to Canada not to make those trips to Canada unless it's absolutely essential. Now is not the time to come for our American friends to be coming just for a visit. And that is for 
the health of potential visitors and for the health of Canadians. So BC has been very clear about that and the federal government is very clear about that too. Now, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, nothing is off the table for Canada and we are very urgently reviewing the situation also in close partnership and collaboration with our neighbor, with our southern neighbors uh, minister blair had a conversation yesterday uh, with his counterpart the secretary of homeland security so these are ongoing and urgent conversations particular care needs to be taken just because that border is a lifeline and we do want to be very clear today to strongly discourage all non-essential travel in both directions across that border. Given the situation that our continent is in, it just doesn't make sense. Maybe if I can just add, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, as a member of parliament who's close to a border with the United States, when we say non-essential travel, that means including crossing the border to buy cigarettes or alcohol, uh, to pick up packages that are delivered to the United States, to uh, do grocery shopping in the United States because the prices may or may not be lower or you need to find specific items that are not available in Canada. These would be considered non-essential trips. And it's very important that people understand when we are saying non-essential trips that are sometimes things that people have taken for granted on a border town for a very long time. Well, we did have some strong economic measures uh, announced both on Wednesday of last week, the $1 billion coronavirus response package, and then a further $10 billion set of measures announced on Friday. Those are strong responses. Uh, I think we all agree with all of the premiers and all Canadians that Canada needs to do more, and we will. Uh, you will be hearing very soon from Minister Morneau about a strong further set of actions we will take. As you heard from Minister Duclos, uh, Canada is in a fortunate position in that we have the fiscal firepower to act, and we will. And I really want to assure Canadians that the federal government will do what it takes to get us through this crisis and to ensure that Canadian workers, Canadian businesses are in a position to come roaring back when the measures imposed by social distancing can be set aside. And we're going to be listening to our health experts as to when that time is, but that time will definitely come. And our job as a government right now is, first of all, Health and safety of can Canadians, absolute priority. I think we all agree we need to do whatever it takes. We have to put in place the measures to help us get through that period. And then we just have to be sure that our economy is ready, you know, to come back out of the gate very, very strong. And we're going to do that. And you're going to be, you're going to like what you hear from Minister Morneau very soon. Thank you. This concludes uh, the uh, press uh, conference. Merci à tous de vous être déplacés. Thank you, everyone. All right, that is uh, a long press conference by a series of cabinet ministers and public health officials today to bring us up to date on a basic message both from them and the prime minister to this country right now, and that is to do as much as possible to try and limit the spread of coronavirus. The prime minister saying again today, stay home if you don't have to leave the house, don't. He, of course, himself uh, is self-isolating right now. I'll just bring you up to date on a couple of uh, bits of news that would be important for you today. Uh, we do have a, a fifth death in this country, and it is the first one in the province of Ontario, the province with the highest number of cases, now confirming a first uh, death of an, an elderly man, 77 years old, uh, who had some underlying conditions, wasn't known to be uh, infected with COVID-19, but subsequently uh, that uh, was the case. 
and his uh, case was related to the fact that he was in contact with someone else. So that's now one death in Ontario uh, and four deaths in British Columbia, all related to a long-term care center there. Um, and, and the other message I think that we heard both from, um, both from Dr. Tam and others today um, is that what they're trying to do right now is stop the chain of transmission to make sure that the cases that uh, could happen from one to one to another without travel uh, are completely broken. And that's why they're asking everyone to really limit social contact. Let's bring in host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas and the CBC's David Cochran for um, your perspectives. Um, maybe I'll start, uh, Vashi, with you on, on the border, um, you know, just because that's sort of where we ended. I, I thought the, the language that the deputy prime minister use there was useful because I think people are still struggling a little bit to understand saying that the border is a lifeline. Yeah, that's the exact term that she used. And it's understandable, even if you break it down to our daily needs right now, what do what does everyone need thinking about the prospect of quarantine or self-isolation for two weeks? Enough food to get through those two weeks. Most of our food, as the, the Deputy Prime Minister pointed out, but as a number of experts pointed out to me over the past 24 hours, during the winter months, during the cold months, comes from the United States. There is a constant back and forth of uh, people who are transporting that food across the border. She did say all also, and this is something that they have said since yesterday, that there are a lot of ongoing conversations and continual conversations with various cabinet ministers and their counterparts in the United States. I know President Trump spoke a bit earlier about the border as well. He has expressed uh, a desire not to close it down because of the integration as well. But clearly there seems to be some kind of conversation going on about what might be done to address the border. It is a concern for Canadian officials, and we see that particularly, for example, in Ontario, where so many of the cases, especially over the past few days, that are arising, when they, when they identify the origin, it's from the United States. There is a greater concern, and we saw that yesterday, about the uh, transmission of, uh, of this through people who are coming home from March break, say, for example. The government has now said if you have any symptoms, you can't even get on that plane, regardless of where you're coming from, even if it is the United States. So I think the border is a justified concern. The solution, however, However, as those ministers and as the prime minister have pointed out, is not really a simple one. No, no. Okay, and, and because you alluded to that clip of Donald Trump, uh, who spoke just a few moments ago, we'll bring you more of that press conference through the day. But he did say uh, more about his considerations in terms of the Canada-U.S. border. Let me show people that clip. Well, Canada has not closed it to the United States, right. so we're working very closely with Canada. And but they have not closed it. They have closed it to the world, but they have not closed it to the United States. Are you States. considering closing the U.S. land border? I don't want to say that, but we are discussing things with uh, Canada, and we're discussing things with Mexico, quite honestly. And uh, again, the relationship is outstanding with both. Outstanding. We just signed our deal, USMCA, and the relationship is very strong. So obviously uh, those conversations ongoing both from a Canadian and an American perspective. David, let me bring in you for, for your uh, thoughts on what we heard from the ministers there. I mean, today is really a lesson about behavior and an attempt to try and stop uh, further transmission. Yeah, there's a real message amplification uh, component to what is happening there today on, on listening to Dr. Tam, listening to the advice and putting in the urgency of the effectiveness of social distancing. The numbers we got yesterday from Dr. New, who is Dr. Tam's assist, uh, you know, deputy, is that essentially 87% of the cases were travel related, 13% were community spread. That was yesterday. That's changing faster than the stock market and the price of oil, but that gives you an idea. The travel related stuff, they can identify, trace and contain. The community spread is the real worrisome stuff. and that that's why the social distancing message is front and center on everything today. Two quick points. I wanted, there was some confusion in the answer on every Canadian being able to come home because it's true and it's not true at the same time. If you're a Canadian and you're abroad and you're sick and you can get to the Canadian border, constitutionally you're allowed in. You can walk there, drive there, train there, bike there. They have to get you in. And we heard Bill Blair say that you will either be uh, assessed by a public health officer or screened over the phone or put into quarantine based on what the situation is. 
it becomes more complex if you have to fly into Canada internationally. That's where the sick Canadians cannot come home. So if you get to the border, you have a right to come in. But if you're sick, you have no right to get on the plane. So that's the distinction uh, that I think it's important to point out there because the answers were a little bit confusing and, and conflicting throughout that news conference. And we had the added challenge of not being able to hear all the questions. Yeah. So the context may have been lost on some people. And, and, and finally, looking ahead to tomorrow, because I know they're all saying we're going to hear from Bill Morneau soon we're going to hear from Bill Morneau tomorrow I don't know if calling this a stimulus package is really the right phrase at mm -hmm, this point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is an aid package this is about putting a floor or trying to put as much of a floor as you can under the personal and national economic slump that is coming so as you heard Christian Freeland saying there right at the end it's about helping businesses roar back once this pandemic phase changes because as you ask pe people to self-isolate and as more people listen you reduce economic activity you reduce income and the measures we've heard the prime minister talk about changing ei canada child benefit gst rebates they are going to pull all the levers they have where they can already put money directly into your bank account a as part of this thing to to sort of keep a roof over your head, keep your lights on, and keep your fridge full of food, and to give businesses the flexibility they have to be able to come back when all of this is okay. over. One of the great lessons from 10, 12 years ago was that a lot of companies couldn't come back. They're trying yeah. to avoid that. Okay, uh, I'm just going to let you both go just for a moment because I want to bring in a, a doctor that we have on standby because none of us are doctors. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Suman uh, Chakra Barti. I hope I got your name there right, doctor. Thanks yes. for being here. Good. Uh, you are an infectious diseases specialist at Trillium Health Partners. Um, I, I want to ask you what you took from, I'm not sure if you've been sitting there that whole time. I appreciate it if you have been. What you took from this real big push to try and get everybody to stay home and not interact with people. Well, this is exactly the message that we've been saying for a couple of uh, weeks now. It's, it's just so important, this idea of social distancing, and I'm so glad to see that we've been doing it, uh, both in the messaging as well as what we're actually seeing. Uh, this state of emergency was important because it allowed the province to um, go down on certain things that were really important, for example, closing bars, restaurants, libraries, any of these things that are gathering. So I just think the messaging has intensified, but it hasn't changed. We've been talking about this for almost a week now, mm -hmm. and it's really important for us to flatten the curve. And if the message is ramping up in this way, it, it is because the window to flatten that curve in terms of what, uh, how many cases there are and the capacity of our health system, it, it is shutting. I mean, Patty Heidi was pretty clear about that. I, and I completely agree. It's important that we do this before. We have to learn our lessons from what's happening in Italy, in Spain, potentially, in, in China as well, of course, is that if you don't do this early enough, uh, then you know, it's not going to have as much of an effect. So we are uh, basically trying to get the biggest bang for our buck by doing this, uh, so to speak, right now. And I uh, am optimistic that it will have an effect to blunt this outbreak. I, I just want to ask you one more question, and that is around the events. Canada's recommendation from the Public Health Agency is still saying don't go anywhere uh, with 50 people or, or you, you can go places where there are 50 people or more. In the United States, the recommendation is 10 people and more. Um, I, you know, I'm just not going anywhere because I'm just <laughs> I'd rather be safe than sorry. Do you think that the next move or, or would you think that Canada should move in the direction of limiting interactions to an even smaller group of people? Yes, I, I think these numbers are, uh, they're not necessarily science-based. I think sure. that the main idea is to try to just avoid any non-essential contact. I know it's difficult, and sometimes it's not pragmatic, obviously, with your household. Let's say if you go out to the grocery store to get uh, well-needed supplies. But I think just to trying to minimize, and just for now, staying away from uh, non-essential meetings, groups of any size, uh, this is like uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau says, it's not going to be like this forever, but no. we all have a responsibility right now. Okay, Dr. Suman Chakrabarti, thank you so much for standing by all that time. I appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Let me uh, just go back to Vashi if I can for a moment as we wrap up our coverage here on CBC and CBC News Network, which will continue coverage after we're off the air. Uh, Vashi, what will you be watching for tomorrow as we wait for that, that key package of measures yeah. uh, to, to help the economy?
I'm watching for exactly what David outlined, and that is to what degree is this about aid and what kinds of aid are going to be offered. It sounded like they need some sort of legislative approach when it comes to flushing out EI and helping it apply to more people. There are a lot, I'm getting a lot of messages from people who are worried about this week's payments, this week's yeah. bills. Will this address their need right now? What's in it for small businesses? And simply, I know this is kind of a macro way to look at it, but how big is it going to be? David had signaled that if you're looking at that 1% of GDP figure, you're looking at at least $20 billion. I'm hearing it could be much higher than that because the, the assessed need at this point, or at least that I should say, the assessed need at this point, at this point, which could change obviously and mm -hmm. will change, mm -hmm. is already so great. Also, maybe just a point uh, about the Emergencies Act, which was mentioned a number of times in the press conference we've shown people. Uh, that is an act that replaced the War Measures Act, and it does seem like, while it's on the table, it seems unlikely that the government is going to pull that trigger right now, Vashi, from, from what we could hear there. Yeah, they were very explicit that it is very much so a last resort and that it would need to be done in concert with the provinces. It sounded like they just began those discussions. I believe the Deputy Prime Minister said today with the Cabinet Committee that is a signed especially to COVID-19. So uh, my guess is that is a, a little ways off and they didn't really explicitly say under which requirements would they need to invoke mm -hmm. it. I think that it appears like the discussions are at a preliminary stage, but certainly if it were to be invoked, that would be a, a bit of a game changer. Okay, my thanks to Vashi Capellas and David Cochran for guiding mm -hmm. us through our coverage again today. Thank you very much. Vashi will of course have more Thank coverage you. on Power and Politics later at 5 Eastern. And David, you can check him on The National with uh, all you need to know. Just an update down to remind you of what the, the key messages were from the government today. The Prime Minister and his Cabinet Ministers saying that again today, you really need to limit your contact with other people. That if you can stay home, you should stay home. And if you are overseas, you should try and get home soon. They announced a measure to uh, borrow money, to lend Canadians money, rather $5,000 to either help you where you are if you can't get back or uh, as a way to get back to pay for tickets if you need to get back urgently. Again, there are some areas Airlines, including WestJet, that are limiting traffic as of Sunday. And we know that the border is being closed to people who are not Canadian or U.S. citizens as of midnight uh, Wednesday, so midnight tomorrow. Uh, we are expecting that economic package to be announced by the finance minister tomorrow. That is the government's next big move to try and help the economy as things continue to ramp up. This is the end of our coverage here on CBC Television. You can watch continuing coverage on CBC News Network. I am Rosemary Barton. Thank you for watching.